I'm going to tell you something that happened on April 2nd, 2013. Uh, that was the day when President Obama unveiled something called the Brain Initiative uh, in the East Room of the White House. Uh, it was definitely the Woodstock for neuroscience. Uh, and this is a research initiative that is designed to dramatically increase understanding of how the brain encodes and processes information. How 80 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses interact to create perception, action, learning, memory, and consciousness. This is what uh, President Obama has called a grand challenge or, or 21st century moonshot. And in the two years since President Obama gave this speech, the public and private sectors have really stepped up. So the director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, has embraced a 12-year, $4.5 billion roadmap to achieve the goals of the Brain Initiative. Federal agencies like NSF and DARPA are making important contributions, as are companies, research universities, foundations, and patient groups. And although it's too soon to tell whether the Brain Initiative is going to be successful, what it does show is the power of a big, hairy, audacious goal to focus the nation's energies on an important problem. So uh, although there's no universally accepted definition of what a grand challenge is, the Obama administration has been focusing on 21st century moonshots that have the following attributes. First, they have the potential to make a major contribution to an important problem in areas like health, education, energy, economic opportunity, or human exploration. Uh, second, they're ambitious but achievable. So if I told you that I want to end scarcity in the next five years, that is certainly ambitious, but it's not achievable. So we should remember the words of the late uh, publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Salzberger, who said, I believe in an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Uh, um, Another goal of, of, of grand challenges, another attribute of them, is that they should be compelling and intrinsically motivating. They should capture the public's imagination. Lots of people should be prepared to devote a large chunk of their career to helping to achieve them. They also need a Goldilocks level of specificity and focus. If I said, I want to improve the human condition, that's great, but it doesn't tell me where to get started. And that's the value of having something like, uh, we want to put... Uh, a man on the moon and have him safely return to the earth that tells you what to do next. So grand challenges have a number of benefits. Uh, one is that they can serve as positive self-fulfilling prophecies by serving as magnets uh, for people and, and resources, by challenging our, our scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs to work on hard and important problems. As President Kennedy observed, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it. The other important thing is that as technologies like bioinfo nanotechnologies become increasingly powerful, in many cases the important question is no longer what can we do, but what should we do? And that is not a purely technical question. That's a question that requires creativity and imagination and in discussion about how we want to define progress in, in the 21st century. So in this April 2013 speech, President Obama called for an all-hands-on-deck effort to identify and pursue grand challenges. Uh, he called for not only government agencies, but uh, philanthropists, universities, companies, and America's storytellers to get involved. Let me give you a couple of examples of some of the moonshots that these different types of organizations are pursuing. The Department of Energy has launched SunShot uh, with the goal of making solar as cheap as coal by the end of the decade. Uh, NASA is backing the Asteroid Grand Challenge with the goal of identifying all of the asteroids that pose a risk to human populations and, more importantly, knowing what to do about them. Uh, USAID has launched several grand challenges in global development, including saving lives at birth with the goal of dramatically reducing maternal and newborn mortality. Philanthropists are starting to target some of their giving to grand challenges. So the Gates Foundation, for example, has grand challenges in global health to develop vaccines that don't require refrigeration or to develop a single crop that can provide all of the nutrients that we need. Universities like UCLA have embraced Sustainable LA, which is a 2050 goal to have 100% sustainability in the LA region 
in energy, water, and biodiversity. Earlier this year at the White House Science Fair, over 120 engineering deans announced that they were gonna back programs like the Grand Challenge Scholars Program that allows students to organize their research, service learning, coursework, and international studies around one of these grand challenges. Companies are also pursuing these 21st century moonshots. So IBM has been driving advances in artificial intelligence by beating Gary Kasparov at chess and Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. Qualcomm is working on a, uh, is sponsoring a $10 million X Prize to develop a tricorder, uh, a mobile wireless device that would diagnose 15 diseases as accurately as a board certified uh, physician. Google is working on a self-driving car that could reduce traffic fatalities by 90%, building on a 2005 DARPA unmanned vehicle race across the Mojave Desert. And Elon Musk, uh, the CEO of SpaceX, has said, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> so his, his modest goal is making humanity a multi-planetary species. Well, just imagine uh, if a large fraction of the Fortune 500 uh, startups and the investors that back them were pursuing similarly ambitious goals. But I also think that there's an important role for America's storytellers. Uh, Dean Kamen uh, likes to say, in a, in a free society, you, you get what you celebrate. And I think that Hollywood and media companies and America's storytellers could do more to lift up uh, these moonshots uh, and the teams that are, that are pursuing them. Um, although you don't often hear uh, White House officials talk about science fiction, uh, I also think there's a really important role for science fiction. So if you th whether it's Arthur C. Clarke's uh, stories about communication satellites uh, or the Star Trek replicator, uh, that these uh, stories have played an important inspirational role uh, in inspiring our, our innovators to work on, on hard problems. And that's why I'm so excited that uh, science fiction writers uh, like Neil Stevenson have teamed up with the Arizona State University to tell the stories of futures uh, in which big stuff gets done. I agree with Neil that uh, too much dystopian science fiction is actually bad for us. Uh, so imagine a future in which more individuals and institutions are working together on really hard and important problems, whether it's developing abundant sources of carbon neutral energy, uh, clean water, life-saving vaccines for diseases of the poor, or breakthroughs in learning technologies that could help our most disadvantaged students. And although uh, obviously the leaders of powerful institutions have a role to play in moonshots, I think there are lots of opportunities for grassroots participation as well. Uh, so we already see citizen scientists and uh, crowdfunders uh, and rank-and-file uh, rank employees getting involved. Uh, recently, volunteers playing a game called Fold It were able to solve the structure of an AIDS-related virus in three weeks. This is something that scientists have been working on for 10 years without any luck. So I don't think uh, we should just be talking about the leadership of organizations. I think everyone has an opportunity to participate in identifying and pursuing uh, grand challenges. So in the immortal words of Scoop Nisker, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. Thank you very much.